I follow the Moscow and down to Kentucky Park, listening to the winds of change. Yes, that's a CI ballad of the 80s. Did you know that? I'm going to prove it to you. I'm going to show it to you. Today, I'm going to do a little uh, breakdown of the Laurel Canyon scene. Of course, the great book by Dave McGowan. If you don't have this book, it's a must get. It's a must read. Weird Scenes Inside the Canyon by Dave McGowan. It parallels very well with my books, Esoteric Hollywood 1 and 2. And what Dave does is essentially what I do except for the music scene, right? Where do we get the counterculture from? Was the counterculture just a totally organic movement that sprung up? Was it a mix? Maybe some of the people were organic and then maybe the counterculture movement of the 60s was co-opted. So what I'm gonna be talking about today is precisely that. I'm gonna talk about how uh, in a brief video, the counterculture scene was actually largely steered and created. There were, of course, some uh, organic figures, some uh, well-intentioned anti-war political motivations on the part of some of the artists. But as the movement grew steam, right, as the counterculture movement of the 60s, especially out of the Laurel Canyon area, as it grew in influence, what we actually see is a steered, engineered social revolution. And it's not something that was actually anti-establishment. In fact, it was promoted heavily by the highest levels of the establishment, including elements out of the CIA, formerly the OSS, uh, things like Time Magazine, AM Radio, the top record companies, all had a big hand in promoting uh, late night TV, et cetera, uh, the, the so-called anti-establishment counterculture. And so this is a basic video for understanding how in the Laurel Canyon scene, which is really the heart of it, not Haight-Ashbury, but in fact, the Laurel Canyon district, what you have that's a, a first key indicator is the giant uh, Lookout Mountain Studios, right? Lookout Mountain Studios is a huge complex. I've actually been there. I've driven past it. It's owned now by Jared Leto. <laughs> it's his own personal residence. So you can see over the fence actually a little bit, and you can see that he's retained some of the uh, Air Force memorabilia there. But that uh, that compound, if you want to call it that, was actually the most cutting edge studio of the time, right? If you go back to the 50s and 60s. And this Air Force studio had a special access that was only given to the top 250 producers, directors, and Hollywood A-listers of that time. So people like Ronald Reagan, people like Howard Hawks, Walt Disney, and Marilyn Monroe, who, by the way, has a Department of Defense ba uh, uh, ID badge. Jimmy Stewart, uh, Jimmy Stewart, uh, here's my video, or, or I'm talking about the FBI, right? Jimmy Stewart, who literally informed and work for the FBI. All these people have this curious relationship to the Laurel Canyon scene. Now, Laurel Canyon is not just relevant for these people. It also has a direct connect to the music scene, right? So a lot of the Hollywood A-listers, a lot of the music scene will come out of this area and it just happens to explode as this so-called cauldron, I guess, uh, this witch's brew of, of creativity, right? <clears throat> The next uh, bizarre thing, though, is that the people from this region, the, the, the famous people, going all the way back to the time of Houdini, um, they happen to have very high-level connections. Many of them come from intelligence families. Uh, they come from high-level political fam families, dynasties, very wealthy banking elite families. And so, for example, Houdini, if you look at the character of Houdini, Houdini actually worked for the Secret Service. Uh, he was actually a spy. He did undercover work while he was doing his uh, routine, right, his magic routine. <clears throat> a lot of people don't know that, but this is one of the early people. And by the way, uh, it's not just Houdini and, and, and people that have high connections. There's a high level of strange deaths, murders, mob hits, even ritual murders that occur in direct connection to the Laurel Canyon scene, including the Manson, including Black Dahlia and other events. But... I think one of the key points that really stands out to prove this thesis is that the Laurel Canyon scene wasn't organic and it can be proven most clearly with the character of Jim Morrison, right? 
<laughs> I mean, uh, I have to admit, yeah, I like some of the Doors music, but a lot of this music that comes out of the scene actually wasn't written by those people. Some of it was. But you have the Wrecking Crew, these different people who are like the studio musicians who create this stuff. And then you have other people like uh, like Jim Morrison, who never actually wrote any music. Uh, man, uh, Morrison was just a, a lyricist, and uh, his lyrics are pretty amusing, actually, if you listen to them. Uh, dry snake to the lake, the lake is wet, it's down by the seaside. The leak and the seaside are both wet. The west is the best. I mean, it's just just gibberish, right? Um, and if you look at some of his student films, though, that's some interesting stuff, too. He was into some really weird things. But a lot of people don't know that his dad was actually involved in the Gulf of Tonkin as an admiral, Admiral Morrison, false flag of it. Yes. So Jim Morrison does not come from a countercultural family. He comes from the highest levels of the establishment. Another character out of the Laurel Canyon scene is Frank Zappa. Right, the weirdo kind of pioneering the fringe uh, and the postmodern in this regard would be Zappa, who Zappa it comes from a family who is also military intelligence. Uh, his dad worked at the Edgewood Arsenal in biowarfare, developing uh, chemical biowarfare agents. In fact, uh, Dave McGowan notes that um, this same Edgewood Arsenal produced uh, the STP drug, which was the most horrendous uh, hallucinogen that was uh, unleashed uh, in Laurel Canyon and in the Haight-Ashbury district via a lot of the Grateful Dead um, concerts uh, in co in concert with the character of Owsley, right? Uh, Owsley, Stanley Owsley uh, will team up with the Grateful Dead to distribute not just LSD uh, in terms of the, I mean, he did do 4 million tabs of LSD, but he also teams up with uh, uh, others to promote and distribute the Harvard invented by Alexander Shulgin, Dow Chemical Creation of STP, this horrendous hallucinogen. He also works at the JPL, uh, right, where we find uh, ritual magicians like Jack Parsons, right, from the, the Crowley circles. We're also going to find a, a consistent pattern of the Crowleyan element popping up in the Laurel Canyon scene as well. Um, the 27 Club should be mentioned too, right, a lot of the people out of the Laurel Canyon scene not just suspicious deaths, but dying at the age of 27. Not everybody, but a lot of the pop stars, uh, Janis Joplin, Mama Cass, Jimi Hendrix. <clears throat> um, I think Jimi Hendrix died. So but uh, Jim Morrison himself. Yes. Amy Winehouse. And then other characters who weren't necessarily at uh, age 27, but do have a connection to uh, this scene, like John Lennon, also uh, were assassinated. And by the way, I think uh, it's it's interesting to note that Mark David Chapman seems to have been a kind of mind-controlled assassin. In fact, uh, Mark David Chapman uh, had a special secret meeting that he that he where he gifted Kenneth Anger, the Luciferian, Crowleyan uh, avant-garde director, right, that stars uh, of, of of famous films like Lucifer Rising, right, this kind of stuff, actually includes uh, uh, members of the uh, Manson gang. Bobby Bazelay, uh, as well as I think Mick Jagger is in one of those playing one of the, the occultic figures. And so the, and I've actually covered, we, I did a whole analysis of one of uh, Kenneth Anger's films, but yeah, Mark David Chapman actually gave a gift of bullets to Kenneth Anger. Interesting. It's almost like there's a, a connection between assassins and cults, right? Something that we've highlighted consistently, right? As well as serial killers. Now, uh, we should also mention um, Papa John Phillips. Papa John Phillips uh, spent time in Cuba fighting for Castro, flying around doing a lot of so-called military intelligence operations, which, again, is just very odd. It's, uh, Stills, as well, from Crosby, Stills, and Nash, also comes from one of these military families. There's a lot of intelligence operations, black ops kind of stuff going on with these families, too. And he attends a military academy, right, uh, again, why do we keep seeing these countercultural figures coming out of intelligence families and military, um, high-level military academies and families? Uh, one of the characters that comes up that's very important uh, as a model to what Manson will be is the character uh, of Vito Palikas. And Vito is a weird character. If you watch some of the videos of Vito, you notice that he, he is a predecessor to, to Charlie. 
what Beto does is gather around kind of a, a groupie, right, mix around him. Um, Zappa was one of the first to really pioneer the idea of having groupies as well as Zeppelin. And then what happens with, with Beto is that this cult goes around and does spectacles, right? They would do these big spectacle scenes, and, they, and he, he gathered a cult around him of women. You can watch videos of him being interviewed. And the weird part is that he never did drugs. <laughs> like, he might have smoked a little bit of uh, the the smoke, but uh, he never advocated or did any of the harder drugs. And yet his followers really seem to, do, to have done this. So it's almost like Vito is a kind of model or a kind of um, template perhaps for the kind of uh, Charlie style cult leader. In fact, Dave lists several points that uh, show commonality between Vito as the model for, um, for Charlie. In fact, Vito was a character who was involved in um, the PEDO type stuff. Uh, he was a guru. Um, he had a, a flock around him of young women and, um, they treated his teaching as the word of a deity or, or, or a god. Um, he was known as the god of F-U-K. Okay? Um, this is also a, a title that was used for Manson. Um, Vito also was connected to uh, the Beverly Hills uh, hairstylists. Right? Um, we think of this curious operation being a hairstylist like Jay Sebring, who was himself a Satanist. It's actually Jay Sebring that in, uh, in, uh, introduced Sammy Davis Jr. to the idea of Satanism and joining the Church of Satan. Um, but Vito was uh, uh, actually best friends with the uh, hairstylist Charles Tex Watson of Manson fame. Yeah. So there's a direct connection to, uh, to Charlie and Vito there. So um, there's also connections to Robert de Grimston, who would be part of the process, right? And the process, as we said, was a split from a UK branch of the, the Crowley OTO, the Lima type of cult, right? It was OTO, and then it became the process and was uh, headed by this character, Robert de Grimston, who was a Luciferian in his philosophy. And this is where Manson will derive a lot of his uh, esoteric kind of mind-controlled um, race, you know, helter skelter stuff. Um, other characters like Dennis Hopper, for example, are important because Dennis Hopper appears to have been a member of one of the Crowleyan lodges along with Dean Stockwell and uh, actor David Carradine's father uh, and, and, and potentially also uh, John Barrymore of right Drew Barrymore family fame. Uh, this is this is important because Dennis Hopper will play actually a lot of roles of psychos, right? We think of Crazy Frank and uh, Blue Velvet, this kind of stuff, right? Um, also worth mentioning is Bruce Dern, uh, one of the key right, figures from this scene, as well as people like Peter Fonda, the Fonda family, Hank Fonda, also having high-level OSS military uh, connections. Um, Bruce Dern's family goes back to uh, having FDR and Eleanor right, Roosevelt as godfathers for them, basically for him. Um, his grandfather was George Dern, who was the Secretary of War and was also Skull and Bones. Uh, so this is, of course, right, is where we get to Laura Dern. Laura Dern has a very, uh, you could say, Hollywood royalty, elite establishment, intelligence establishment type of family. Um, the Fondas, as we said, uh, Hank Fonda was married to the ex of a guy named George Brokow, who was for a while married to CIA operative Claire Booth Luce. And C uh, Claire Booth Luce, of course, is, uh, was with um, um, the Booth of Time Magazine fame, right? Henry Booth. And Time Magazine played a key role, by the way, in promoting not just this uh, 60s musical scene, but also on the cover of Time, they were actually promoting the uh, shroom agenda. Yeah. So what is counterculture? Again, being advertised, signaled, prompted, promoted from the highest levels, the wealthiest members of the establishment, right? Because people think that, well, the establishment is the people in government. I don't know. The establishment is the people above the level of government, the social engineers, and the extremely elite families. And so they had a, a vested interest in, in steering and controlling the culture and putting it into this uh, 
on this trek of revolution, right? Again, this is where we get the importation of the Far Eastern ideologies like the Beatles. The Beatles also spent time in the Laurel Canyon scene, as did people like uh, Steven Spielberg, as did people uh, that you might not expect, like Rand Corporation luminary Albert Wolstetter. Yes, Wolstetter would have private meetings for his devotees, right, of RAND. This is the biggest neocon think tank in the history of the world behind the whole Cold War, behind Gulf, uh, the Gulf uh, events and all of that. And you've got Albert Wolstetter literally having meetings of his devotees in his Laurel Canyon house. I mean, this is just insane, right? So the reality is that this is not right a, an anti-establishment system. You can even go into uh, people like uh, a convicted PEDO, Ron Patterson, the creator of Renaissance Fairs. He's also a product of the Laurel Canyon scene. Um, people don't know this. Comedian Phil Hartman is a product of the Laurel Canyon scene. And as I mentioned, Stanley Owsley, like, as well as, you know, people like uh, uh, um, uh, Tim Leary, right? And Leary obviously had a, a key role in this scene. And so uh, what we get here, by the way, not just them, but also evangelical groups that would that would come out of this, the Jesus people, the Calvary Chapel people, um, Fure uh, of uh, the, uh, the band Buffalo Springfield, one of the Laurel Canyon bands, he's the beginning of the Calvary Chapel, um, so-called church. So, you know, what we actually see going on here is a lot of cr criminal organized crime operations. Spawn Ranch was famous for uh, SNU type FF films, if you know what I mean. Um, and again, as I said, Elizabeth Short being uh, uh, killed in the Black Dahlia case, right? And George Hodel having a direct connect with uh, John Huston, a lot of high level uh, Hollywood directors and people like Man Ray. Man Ray, the avant garde surrealist artist who himself was a confessed Luciferian, a big fan of Marquita Saad. Uh, and so that's what we have, right? All the way up into the 80s with uh, people connected to uh, the, the, the character of Miles Copeland, famous CIA operative who I've covered in my Global Elite book series, uh, Game of Nations. And of course, he is the father of Stuart Copeland, uh, the police, right? Uh, Sting, et cetera. So what we, what we start to see is that the, the so-called counterculture is really uh, a, an establishment counterculture that's steered from above. And this story is completely overlooked and forgotten unless you go and, and check out the excellent work of Dave McGowan. I highly recommend And also my books, Esoteric Hollywood, one and two, which you get signed copies on my website. Be sure and like and share. And uh, if you don't know about this, I'll leave a link below as well to a deeper dive, right, that I've done into this whole scenario um, in other videos and other talks.